Good morning. What a blessing it is to be here today. Our scripture memorization for this week that you'll see in your bulletin is Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, where Isaiah said, or God says to Isaiah to tell his people that my ways are higher than your ways. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, he tells them. Too many people today want to put themselves in the place of God. We think we know what is best, and, and God will we'll, we'll consult him later. But God knows what is best. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. And when it comes to coming into his presence, he's asked us what to do. He's told us what to do. He's told us about our mindset, about how we are to come humbly before him, to bring honor and glory to him in his presence. Today's scripture reading is 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will, neither, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. It is wonderful to be here. You know, we have a, um, a reminder taking place in this series which we're doing. If you'll look down in the verses following where Bryant so capably just read, you will see three times the Apostle Peter says, I will leave these things for you as a remembrance, as a reminder. This reminder comes all the way down to our day and time and continues to remind us. And it's important for us as we look to these Christian graces that we add to our faith that we are constantly reminded of these things for two reasons, a positive reason. Number one, an abundant entrance shall be supplied to us into that heavenly kingdom. But a negative reason is that if these things are not ours, we are short-sighted, even to blindness. And so there's the positive and the negative. We need to be reminded of both as we go through this life. We're so glad that you're here today. I hope that you have been blessed thus far as we have worshipped together in songs and prayers, in the sharing of the supper and in the giving of our means. And, and now as we look into God's word, we want to hear from him. And I, 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 wish, I wish we could cover it all in one sitting. But God's word is so complete that even a small portion of it requires a great deal of time. And so we're handling each of these graces one at a time as we go through. And even though in the short amount of time that we do have, we cannot completely cover these, hopefully it will spur you on to greater study yourself as you are reminded of these things. Would you please pray with me as we begin this morning? Heavenly Father, you are truly a great and awesome God. You are worthy of all of our praise, honor, and glory. We thank you, Father, for sparing our lives to this day and time that we may gather together as your people to worship you. We thank you for the amazing sacrifice of your son, Jesus, for what that means to each of us and to all of us. And we're thankful, Father, for the amazing act of his resurrection which gives to us that blessed hope of his return 
and of our resurrection as well. We thank you, Father, for the word that you've given us. And as we look into it this morning, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your encouragement. Help us to be of open heart and open mind as we approach your word. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. In this second epistle, Peter has a very short message. But in this short message of these, what we have now and know as three chapters in this letter, there is so much to be covered. And we're spending uh, seven, eight, nine weeks covering a small portion of this letter, and we still will not be able to do it justice. But as we look into this beautiful letter, let's once again look at the introduction. We will not read or reread what Bryant has just read, but let's read down to that point, looking at the first four verses. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us and righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, and we go into what it is that we add to our faith. This is the last recorded writing of Peter that we have that is brought down to our time. Whether Peter wrote other things, we do not know, but this is the last one the Holy Spirit has preserved for us and included in our scriptures. And so this is, in effect, his last will and testament as far as we are concerned. And he wants to remind everybody at the very beginning that by the divine power of God, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. If God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, what else do we need? You can answer. Nothing. We need nothing else. We need God's revelation that he has given us. And if God has given us all things that pertain to life, and that covers every aspect of our lives, and godliness, how we live before God, if he's given us all things, then perhaps we need to look into those things to know how to properly live our life and how to live a life that is godly. And as we look at these Christian graces, we see this amazing gift that God has given us. God did not leave us orphans. As Jesus comes to his apostles the night he was betrayed, he says, I will not leave you orphans. I will send to you a helper, a comforter, who will ultimately remind you of the things that I have spoken to you and will guide you into all truth. They made sure that all truth was recorded for us. And so we are not left orphans either. You know, there are so many people today in the world and... Um, as I mentioned some time back from my previous trip to Guyana, I'm sitting in the airport in uh, Georgetown, and, and up on the screen, they've got a, a local faith healer. And, and this faith healer is going through, and people are coming through, and there's no verification of anything that he's doing. He's just, you know, he's touching people or hitting them or whatever he's doing, and they're healed. You know, it's one of those situations. And, he's, and he keeps talking about how God has told him something, and God has told him something. Folks, if you want God to tell you something, you need to open this up. You don't need to listen necessarily to what I think. You need to listen to what God says. And that holds true to everybody else as well. We need to be Bereans in the sense that Acts 17, verse 11, says that uh, we give diligence to searching the Scripture to make sure that all the things that are said are true. They did that to the Apostle Paul, who had the full measure of the Holy Spirit. And if they did that to him, and Paul saw that as a good thing, he, he related that to Luke, who recorded Acts for us. If he saw it as a good thing, 
then all of us ought to see it as a good thing as well. We need to search the scriptures to make sure that things are true. It's important for us to recognize that. And so we are building this amazing pyramid. Our foundation is faith. Because nothing else matters. If you look at all of the things that we are to add to our faith, none of those have any relevance without the like, precious faith that Peter refers to in that opening section. The same faith that the apostles had, we need to have. And we add to that virtue. And as we looked deeply into that word, we saw that it has uh, a, a meaning of moral courage. You know, so many people, they have faith, but they don't have the courage to put that faith into action. To that moral courage, we spoke about knowledge last week. You know, the religion of Jesus is a religion of the mind. And it is a religion of the mind that when the mind is impacted with the words of God, our heart is impacted and we are changed. We are pricked to move in certain directions. We see that very thing taking place on the day of Pentecost. As the word of God is spoken, it enters into the minds of those who heard. And what was the result? They were pricked in their heart. And so it is a, a thinking man's religion. And our thinking governs our emotions. And it governs everything else that we do. And so we saw the importance of loving the Lord our God, the greatest command, the first command, as Jesus mentioned on a number of occasions, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so knowledge needs to be added to that courage because you have faith, you have courage, but you don't have knowledge, you might go off in all kinds of different directions. Today we want to talk about self-control. In the coming weeks, we're going to talk about perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and also agape love, which is, in essence, the capstone of everything that we are talking about. Because just in the same way that our foundation, everything builds on our faith, everything has to be governed from the top down with the agape love of coming from God. There's, it's like a, a beautiful sandwich that God has created for us, and everything rests in between there. So, self-controlled faith. Let's look at this for just a few moments this morning. This idea of self-control is, um, is a word there in chapter 1 and verse 6 that really refers to athletes who are competing in sports. Athletes who compete in sports. The Apostle Paul uses the same word, but it's translated differently in the, the New King James Version that I'm preaching from. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 25, it says it's temperate in all things. It's the same word translated self-control here. And he's talking about uh, taking care of his body in the same way that an athlete takes care of their body. Self-control is important. If you've ever done any athletic or physical endeavor, you know that you have to be committed, you have to be self-controlled, you have to be disciplined in those things. This, this word, as it was used during the time of Paul, referred to a preparation for games, uh, much along the lines of what we would think of as the Olympic Games and some other contests. And the athletes, as they prepared... Uh, and this is a quote that I pulled out of uh, a history book during the time. They abstain from unwholesome foods, from wine, and from sexual indulgences. And that's how that word has made its way into our language as self-control. Putting aside one thing for the sake of something else. Self-control. It's important because what did the athletes recognize? Well, if they weren't self-controlled, if they didn't discipline themselves, if there weren't certain things that while they were competing they abstained from, what would their performance do? It would tank. What's our performance, spiritually speaking, going to be like if we are not self-controlled? Our, our spiritual uh, endeavor that we engage in is not going to be successful. In the book of James, James tells us something that, quite frankly, um, we, we would do well to revisit from time to time. There we go. 
James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he t himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do you know that Satan can't make you do anything you don't want to do? Now, he's more powerful, he's a lot smarter than we are, and he's got a lot going for him that we don't have. But he cannot force you to do something you do not want to do. One of the things that I remember in my life uh, growing up, uh, in the late 1960s and early 70s, there was a variety show on television. Some of you may remember it, called the Flip Wilson Show. How many of you remember that show? Flip Wilson was hilarious. And he had a female character that he played on that show called Geraldine. You guys remember Geraldine? And every time she'd get in trouble, what was her, her, her saying that she'd always say? The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And of course, it was always a punchline and they always got a big laugh. Folks, the devil doesn't make you do anything. He can tempt you. He, he knows where you're weak. He can provide stumbling blocks in front of you. But you have to willingly give in to those things. You can choose to say no. Did the devil make Jesus sin in the wilderness? I doubt there's any temptation that you've ever had that is as strong as the temptations he endured in that wilderness. And he couldn't make Jesus sin. You see, what is our problem? Our problem is self-control. Our problem is that, that we have certain desires and we are prone from time to time and under certain circumstances to give in to those desires. Now, when we were in the world before we came to Christ, before we had our sins remitted, uh, our immersion, guess what? It didn't matter, did it? We, we didn't have to be self-controlled. We could do whatever we wanted to do because we, in essence, were our own master, even though we didn't realize that it was sin that was mastering us. We were our own master, and we were in control of ourselves. But once we take on a new master who is Jesus Christ, now all of a sudden the principles of Christ have to be our guiding force. You see, because of all wrongdoing lies ultimately in selfishness. It's about self. It's about what I want. That's basically what it comes down to. And the song that we sang, we haven't sung it. I don't think we've sung it since, since I've been here for a year and a half. It is one of those songs that I, I always remember, and I'm so glad that Chris picked it out, None of Self and All of Thee. You see the progression in that song? You know, if you ever lead that song, and, you, and, and as we typically do in the church, sing the first, second, and fourth, it, wouldn't you hate to be a, a third stanza and a fourth stanza song? Because it gets left out a lot, right? But that's a song you can't leave it out, can you? Because it tells a story. It builds from one to the other to the other to the other. And finally, in the end, the person gets it. None of self and all of thee. We have a new master, and so we no longer are op operating by selfishness. In Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle Paul makes a reminder himself, just as Peter does, makes a reminder of what the Christians in Ephesus once were. He's writing to a divided church, a church of Jews and Gentiles, and there were some difficulties there. Look at these first three verses. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Before we came to Christ, before we put him on in baptism, we lived a life by the world's standards and values. 
a life of selfishness. We were under that power. We were under the control of the prince of the power of the air. Why? Because we voluntarily made him our master. He became our master. We, we, we gave him. When we turned our back on God at whatever that age was, when we realized we were doing wrong and continued to do that, we turned our back on God and we said, Satan, you're, you're in charge. Paul refers to it as having dominion over you in Romans chapter 6. It was a life of disobedience. And this is not talking about being disobedient to parents, but that would certainly be included. This is a life of disobedience to God in following after the precepts of God in this life. It was a life that was at the mercy of desire, just as James, we just previously read, had written, that we were drawn away by our desires. It was a life under the mercy of desire. And it was not only at the mercy, but it was a life that followed the desires of the flesh. We gave in to those things, he says. And it is a life that was worthy of only one thing, and that is the wrath of God. That was our former condition. But in Titus chapter 3, Paul's encouragement to the preacher, the evangelist Titus, Chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Now let's stop right there. Sounds like what he just wrote to the Ephesians, right? Using different words, describing the same condition. But, you know, he uses that that same word in verse 4 in chapter 3 two of Ephesians he says but God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us made us alive together in trespasses by grace we have been saved here he uses the word but but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared not by the works of righteousness that we have done but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Spiritual self-control is something that is only possible and can only be maintained when we place our reliance upon God. If the Apostle Paul struggled, as we mentioned in Romans chapter 7, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, these are the things that I do. If he struggled, and he had that full measure of the Holy Spirit that we mentioned earlier, the Holy Spirit wasn't going to force him to do what he didn't want to do. You understand that. Didn't, Didn't keep him from sinning. But what did he have within his body? He had certain desires. And so what did he do? He beat himself. He disciplined himself that he could be temperate in all things, just like an athlete. Self-control. These two right over here got more self-control than me. James and Tricia. That's exactly right. I, I'm an ice cream fanatic, and if you think you can compare with me, let's tr- uh, we'll trade notes in a little bit, okay? I love ice cream. I'll eat it every night. I don't care if it's 20 degrees outside, I'll eat ice cream. I love it. These two love it as much as I do. James, when do you eat ice cream? Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. At the home Bible study, Tuesday night, we've got 25 people there. It was mine and Susie's time to bring the dessert. We brought three half gallons of ice cream. White chocolate raspberry yum, vanilla chocolate chip, and butter pecan with caramel swirl. Okay, now, if I wasn't being a roadblock to our brother James and Trisha over here, I don't know what I was. But it wasn't Wednesday. 
And so what did you say? It's not Wednesday. That's a lot more self-control than I've got. You know what I told him? I said, well, if you follow the timeline around the world, it's Wednesday somewhere right now. <laughs> he said that wasn't good enough for him. He was self-controlled. He, I know, that's right. But you didn't give in. You were not driven away by your desires. Folks, there are things in our life, and that's kind of a silly story, but, um, but you understand. There are things that are temptations to us to draw us away by our desires. Whether those things be sexual, whether those things be related to food or to drink or to money or to any number of things, there are, we all have our weaknesses. Those weaknesses do not disappear when somebody hands us a towel as we get out of the baptistry. Do we understand that? We still have weaknesses in our lives. And so we have to trust and rely upon God to help strengthen us. We've got to be self-controlled. Add to your faith moral courage, to moral courage a knowledgeable faith. To that knowledge, we need to add self-control. Why? Because of what we once were is what we can very easily go back into. We can return there so easily if we're not careful. And we have to be self-controlled. What do you think Satan's going to do when he finds out that you've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've put him on in baptism? What do you think he's going to do? Say, well, no, I'm done with him or her. I guess I don't have her. Do you think that's what he's going to say? Or do you think he's going to come at you and he's going to attack you? He's going to hit you where you're weak. And let me tell you something. I, t I mentioned this a while ago. That Satan is smarter than you. Okay? He's a lot smarter than you. He's a lot smarter than me. And he knows where you're weak. And he's not going to waste his time coming at you where you're strong. He, he might just throw something at you to try to chink your armor a little bit. But where is he going to hit you? He's going to hit you where it hurts. He's going to find those weaknesses. It might be your children, it might be your parents, it might be your spouse. But he's going to hit you from somewhere, maybe a desire that you have. Maybe it's something that you, you've struggled with in the past, and now you think that you, you've conquered it, but all of a sudden he sees an opening, and what does he do? He takes advantage. We have to constantly rely upon God for our strength through prayer, through study, and through fellowshipping with one another, coming together as the body of Christ and encouraging each other. You know, something we don't do in modern Christianity that I think was probably more present during uh, the New Testament times is we don't hold each other accountable like we should. You know, we, we don't call each other up. We don't go visit. And we don't, we don't ask, you know, how are you doing this week? You know I, know, I know you mentioned the other day that you were struggling with some things. How's that going? You know, we probably would be doing a lot better as brothers and sisters in Christ if we were open enough to be able to share those things with each other, number one, and number two, that we would, would lovingly, gently, and kindly try to hold each other accountable and encourage each other. I think we'd do a lot better because God put us in community for a reason. Because we're stronger together than we can ever be apart. This community that, that Jesus calls his church, the church that he built, this community, this body of believers, we're stronger together than we can ever be apart. And we need to bear that in mind. Skipping back to chapter 2 in Titus. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live how? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Tell me, when's the present age? When's the present age? Now. When was the present age for Titus? It was then, over 1,900 years ago. When's the present age now? It's now, 2017, July. Can you believe it's July already? Hard to believe. As we are denying ungodly lust, as we are trying to live soberly, righteously, and godly, what is it that strengthens us in our resolve? Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Folks, we need to be looking to the return of Christ. We need to be looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing that will drive us. Why do we know that? Because guess what's going to happen in your lifetime? I, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. But I'm going to tell you one or two things are going to happen in your lifetime. You're going to die or the Lord's going to return. It's going to happen. And I'm not a prophet. All I do, I just read what God says. We're either going to die or the Lord's going to return. And at either rate, we all will experience the glorious returning of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So how ought we to live our lives? If he died to purify us, we need to seek to be self-controlled. We need to, to allow God to help us in that resolve. Add to your faith moral courage. To moral courage, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. For if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful. And so, an abundant entrance is going to be supplied. That's what Peter tells us by the guidance of our Father in heaven. Those words come down to us today. May we take those things to heart. May we be reminded of those things as we go through this week. And may we seek to apply these things each and every day as we walk in this life. Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ came down to this earth to die for us, to, to purchase us with his own blood. He did that because of the great love of our Heavenly Father and of himself. He became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He did not sin, but he died for our sins. He took them upon him. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Jesus took our sins. He nailed them to that cross. He paid the price for your sins. In loving appreciation for what God has done for you, he calls us to believe, in Jesus Christ, not only in his life and the things that he taught, but also believe that he died for you, that he was buried, that he was raised that third day, and that he's coming back. He asked us to confess that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He asked us to repent of the sins in our life for which Jesus died and to put on Christ in baptism, having our sins washed away, and being raised up to walk in a new life, a forgiven life, a life where now we can pursue true self-control and add to that beautiful faith that we profess. If you have not done those things today, I would encourage you to give strong consideration to those things. If you, if you are ready, please do not wait. Do not hesitate. Give your life to Jesus today. For those of us who have, we still struggle we still have to live in this world even though we are not of this world. There are temptations that come our way. There are circumstances that befall us. There are diseases and discouragement and all sorts of things that impact our lives. Can we pray with you? Can we pray for you? Can we encourage you this morning? Do you have a need? Won't you surrender those needs to Jesus as together we stand and as we sing?